Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our Innovation Showcase hosted by Taewoong Medical USA. I'm happy to introduce Shirley Wang with Taewoong, who is going to get us started. Shirley, I will turn it over to you. Thank you, Lauren. Hello, everyone. Welcome to our Innovation Showcase. My name is Shirley Wang. I am with Marketing at Taewoong Medical USA. We are honored today to have Dr. Imad Kendall here to present a thyroid RFA case discussion. So for today's agenda, I'm first going to go over some innovative features of our Viva Combo RF system. And then Dr. Kendall will present an interesting case with us. There will be time for Q&A at the end. So please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen to submit any questions you may have about the procedure or our devices. So without further ado, let's jump right in. Start at RFA system has, a, has the longest history on the market in the treatment of thyroid lesions. It has been helping patients around the globe for over 15 years. And Taewoon Medical USA is the exclusive distributor for StarMed thyroid RFA system. The Viva Combo RF generator is suitable for either monopolar or bipolar applications. It comes with a continuous power output mode and a real-time impedance monitoring system dedicated for thyroid ablations. Safety has always been at the heart of our innovations. Our generator comes with an automatic shutoff safety control and a Viva pump cooling system to minimize tissue charring. Our STAR RF electrode is the first electrode on the market designed for thyroid nodules. It is also the electrode with the longest history in treating superficial lesions in the thyroid gland. Our sharp tip technology has been praised by many physicians as it enables smooth tissue punctura puncturability without the need of a scalpel or an incision. We're currently the only company on the market that offers a range of electrode sizes to accommodate a variety of thyroid indications. We offer two gauge sizes, 18 and 19, and three shaft lengths, seven, eight, and 10 centimeters. We also offer four active tip length selections, four, five, seven, and 10 millimeters to target a range of neck indications from small structures like lymph nodes, parathyroid to large thyroid nodules. Currently, the four millimeter active tip size is the smallest tip offered on the market. To facilitate our physicians on board, we launched a comprehensive thyroid RFA training program with our partner physicians in 2019. And since then, we have trained over 100 physicians and they came back with great feedback. For more details, you can visit taeyoungacademy.com. Dr. Imad Kendall is a professor of surgery and the chief of general endocrine and oncological surgery at Tulane University Medical School. Dr. Kendall is the first physician in the USA to perform over 150 cases on thyroid RFA. Please welcome Dr. Kendall. Thank you, Sherry, for the introduction. Um, so uh, I'm honored to be with uh, all my colleagues here in the ES, and we're going to go through first a case that I would like to share. My favorite patient to offer the radiofrequency ablation for are patients with hyperactive nodule. And uh, this is here a patient here where we can see a hypervascular nodule in the left thyroid lobe. And um, you can see the images. Um, so I, I like to go actually with the short axis technique. And you can see here, I start from lateral to the middle to medial. Um, and um, my preferred um, tip size probe is a seven millimeter. But uh, depending on the size, you decide on the energy level too. So if I'm using a seven millimeter tip size, I will uh, use 25 watts for energy. If I'm using a small lesion, uh, then I will use uh, 15 for the five millimeter and uh, 35 watts for the one centimeter if you are trying to ablate uh, a huge nodule. Um, you can see the bubbling, which is an effect of the ablation, but you also need to focus more on the impedance. And you try to get the impedance to uh, approximately 200 ohms to, to get an appropriate ablation of the nodule. Uh, during the procedure, I talk to the patient. The patient is fully awake and uh, try to make sure that the voice is good. And we try to stay away from the dangerous triangle 
um, by the entrance of the nerve me, uh, medial to the trachea. So with this, we'll go with the presentation. I'm gonna try to go through a few slides sharing my experience with the procedure and we'll take it from there. So, so in my practice, every single patient gets an ultrasound exam. Ultrasound is part of the physical exam. My practice, I do have uh, two rooms for ultrasound uh, exam. So it's something that I think if you want to do this, this is, has to, to be very comfortable with the procedure and with the biopsies. And I also ultrasound everybody in the OR. And I think even if you do not have this available in the clinic, you need to try to make sure you're comfortable with the, with the anatomy and the procedure. But I think uh, most of us do biopsies. So uh, adopting this technology should be really something very easy for us as surgeons. There is uh, significant data on the ethanol ablation uh, for uh, cystic thyroid nodules. And I was a big fan of this and I had a couple of publications on uh, the field, but uh, as we know, the ethanol ablation was a little bit disappointing with solid nodules. I published before a meta-analysis looking at percutaneous ethanol ablation versus free operation for locally recurrent papillary thyroid cancer. And basically the conclusion that free operation was associated with the 3.5% pooled risk of complications compared to a significantly lower risk of complications with ethanol ablation. Uh, this is a slide from the uh, Italian experience you, uh, looking at six institutions uh, uh, from Italy with um, uh, almost 400 patients. And the, the, the take home message here that you expect the shrinkage in the nodule for the volume reduction rate to continue with time to maximize a six month, but then start to plateau approximately a year after the ablation. This is here a table with the possible complications related to the procedure from the, this uh, large experience from six institutions. And as you can see in general, the risk of complications is, uh, extremely low. The recontra nerve injury is uh, well below 1%. Um, in my own experience, I'm almost near 200 cases so far. I had one patient who had uh, vocal cord paresis, and it took a couple of months for a recovery from the, um, from the ablation, uh, from the thermal injury to the recontra nerve, but it was completely recovered. This is here to show, uh, we have a paper that's under review right now where we combined the, our early experience with the Hopkins experience. And we actually compared it to our prior experience with ethanol ablation. And um, you can see that the volume reduction rate was an average 41% uh, in the uh, radiofrequency ablation compared to 22% in the ethanol group. This was a six month period. Our rate uh, of volume reduction rate significantly improved with time to be near 60% with the uh, experience. This is here an experience with my first 100 benign thyroid nodules with time. And uh, you can see it start to plateau again after uh, around the six month period. But on average, um, we had over 50% volume reduction rate. We have patients that had a reduction rate of over 90%. And, uh, uh, patients are extremely happy with this. Most, the, mostly patients with large nodules, compressive symptoms are the patient who really appreciate it because the symptoms are away and you can see the visual appearance. Uh, I do have the, the, the option of doing elastography on thyroid nodules and I publish this related to ethanol. It's well known that increased internal vascularity is a risk factor for um, resistance to treatment by radiofrequency ablation. So I looked into elasticity and uh, vascularity. And uh, as you can see here, vascularity did affect the volume reduction rate, but if you do have um, a stiff nodule and high vascularity, the volume reduction rate will be the lowest, will be somewhere between 30% compared to near 80% of the nodule is a soft nodule without an internal vascularity. Uh, my favorite patient for this approach are the patients with hyperactive nodule. Uh, this was uh, one of uh, my first uh, patients that I treated with the radiofrequency ablation. It was 84-year-old gentleman from Florida. Uh, 
I was trying to speak to my friend physician about this. So this patient has been um, walking around with uncontrolled uh, hyperthyroidism with this hyperactive nodule and maximized dose of antithyroid medications. And after just uh, a one minute treatment with the radiofrequency ablation, you can see here the volume reduction rate um, approximately three months after the treatment was near 70%. But the most importantly, his TSH was 14 uh, when we checked it at uh, his post-op visit. So basically, he was cured from this disease. The, it's interesting to know that there is no effect on thyroid function test by radiofrequency ablation or any other ablation techniques. Uh, the risk of hypothyroidism is, uh, is well below 1%. Uh, um, I did not see in my experience so far any patient who had really hypothyroidism, but also this is what the data show in the literature. So um, there is a published meta-analysis on radiofrequency ablation on a hyperfunction nodule. And this is here the table of the uh, uh, studies that were included, approximately seven studies. And basically um, what they um, showed that the, the reduction, the volume reduction rate can be up to 86%. Um, and the, the Q rate is approximately um, 75%. Um, you can see here also that uh, there is, they published the data on the uh, 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 scientography proven recovery of the function in 60% and um, uh, different numbers, but it's not 100%, but like a good percentage of these patients, three quarters of these patients will be cured with the radiofrequency ablation. A recurrence is an issue. So what I did, I did uh, try to review that. This was an old paper a few years ago. So I tried now to look at radiofrequency ablation versus the ethanol versus what published in laser ablation recently on the hyperfunction nodule. And this is here, you can see 12 articles for radiofrequency ablation, 11 for uh, ethanol and uh, four articles for laser ablation. And we identify three additional articles compared to what was published in the prior meta-analysis on the radiofrequency ablation for uh, hyperfunction nodule. Um, and sorry, the slides are just not moving. I'm trying to control this remotely. And here's the table that includes the approximately 12 studies with ethanol ablation and four studies, as I mentioned, uh, uh, three of them uh, from Italy on the laser ablation for hyperactive nodules. So what we found that uh, we looked at the failure rate and the complication rate. The failure rate was significantly lower in radio frequency group, 3.5% compared to 16% approximately in the ethanol group compared to 13% in the laser group. And um, the complication rate uh, was also lower, but it was not statistically significant. It was 5.8 for the radio frequency compared to uh, maybe one quarter of the cases on the ethanol and the laser ablation. So uh, that's it. So I really think it's a technique that um, um, can be a good alternative for patients with benign thyroid nodules. There is published data now, uh, multiple recent publications. I did not want to go through this for um, um, small, uh, well-differentiated papillary thyroid cancer, and also for patients who are high-risk uh, thyroid cancer who are not a good candidate for an operation. And the results are really impressive. Um, I think really this is the future. I think uh, endocrine surgeons are the best uh, one really uh, prepared to do these operations. Uh, I think endocrinologists might be uncomfortable using these big, huge needles in the thyroid, worried about hematoma, worried about the recurrent laryngeal nerve. Um, and um, we do have access to these patients and I think we can help these patients uh, very well with uh, with this uh, really minimally invasive option. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the audience?
Dr. Kendall, excellent, excellent uh, presentations. Uh, this is a uh, from uh, Taeyong Medical. So do you think you can share with us your learning curves? I know that you cool, you know, you did already close to 200 and then there's a lot of physicians from the US they are about to start and they're always curious about the, what's the learning curves and what else they need to do practice before actual you know, procedures. So can you share your experience? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you very much for the question, but uh, let me really say this. So I was uh, trained by uh, different companies uh, related to this uh, approach. And um, I, I have to highlight that uh, I had really an excellent experience with uh, Taiwan, like not in a single case, I did not have the rep available to make sure that everything is uh, uh, prepared well and uh, things are uh, uh, ready to uh, and done right. Uh, so, you know, as I said, if, if, if the surgeon is trained to do biopsies very well, this procedure should not take significant time. I think um, uh, we can do these cases like really from the, from the patient entering the room to leaving the wheels in and out under 20 minutes. The procedure itself, once they do the timeout, is almost all the time under 10 minutes, and it can be even less with a smaller nodule. Uh, you only spend longer time with a significantly large nodule, like a nine centimeter nodules and stuff like this. I, I learned from experience after the one complication that they had with the recontraction nerve that was temporary, uh, that uh, maybe less is better. Um, so what does that mean? I, you know, I felt that I am with experience, I'm burning more, I'm seeing more volume reduction rate on the first 30 days after the ablation. So usually I see patient one month, three months, six months, and uh, then a year after uh, the ablation. Uh, so I started to burn more but when I had that uh, like complication, this patient, by the way, had maybe 91% volume reduction rate, but I learned maybe I'll burn less and I will have less complication. <laughs> so this is really a lesson that uh, I started to do a little less and specifically less towards the uh, dangerous triangle. Um, but it's, it's very easy for, um, um, for endocrine surgeons who are really like comfortable with the procedure to do this procedure. I see here a, a question from Dr. Howe about how does this probe differ from liver probes? Does this have times? Do you see the whole lesion? Um, so, so I do not have experience with the liver, Dr. Howe, uh, with the liver probe. I think maybe uh, I'll leave this to Mansu, but uh, I, I look, uh, as I said, for the bubbling effect and also I monitoring for the impedance and for me I will have the rib keep uh, saying the the numbers loud you can actually look at it but I want to keep my eye focused on the lesion the entire time and the rib will keep like uh, mentioning the numbers and I move the probe um, up as uh, once I get an impedance of uh, 200. I don't know if uh, Mensu you want to comment how different is this probe from the liver probe? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually, the first case, we did it over 20 years ago, we using a liver device, like a liver ablation devices, because that time there's no device designed for the thyroid. So, you know, had to using it, but obviously there's a limitations on the size. And then because of the, you know, a little bigger size, bigger ablations, we couldn't ablate it as much as we can. So we changed all the design of the probe, but the concept will be the very, very similar. But the needle itself is a very small and the 18 gauge and 19 gauge and ovulation zone will be much smaller that uh, you can exactly targeting to the small nodules and ovulating it. So that will be the biggest difference between liver uh, device versus thyroid device. Yeah, thank you. So I have here multiple questions. I see Dr. Peter Andrews asking me a question about the medial approach, the transesmic approach versus the short ax approach that I use. So Dr. Andrews, I, I used to do the transesmic when I started, but it's a little bit troublesome for me. And I honestly think, let's say that this is the lesion. I don't see any difference between coming from the medial approach versus coming this approach. If this is the lesion, I start from the lateral side and I keep going from, to the middle until I keep the medial part, which is the most dangerous part to the end. I, I'm, I'm like, I'm a believer that this is enough and this is perfect. Uh, my results speaks to itself. 
uh, anyone is welcome to come and watch. You have a legion, you can burn it that way or that way. Make sure you stay away from the dangerous triangle. And um, I have extreme respect to all my colleagues who uh, insist that this should be done with the transatomic approach. I, uh, I don't see why you need to do it that way versus the standard uh, short axis approach. I intend to do a study comparing both approaches. At least in my experience, the transatomic will take definitely longer time but I, I feel much better control with the short axis. I can see my needle all the time, the tip of the needle. I'm very comfortable with the technique. It just um, is very natural. I can do this like literally backhanded. Anyone who does biopsies can do this very easily. Uh, this is my personal opinion, but I plan to do a study to, to prove that. Um, there was... Um, uh, uh, yeah, somebody asked about the second time for a uh, need for another application. So as I mentioned um, in earlier in my experience that I learned to do a little less to avoid the possible complications. And I tell this to patients, you know, I, I, I make sure that you are happy with maybe less reduction versus having uh, vocal cord paralysis. Um, but um, uh, you know, from different meetings, I've seen different people doing like a staged approach. For a large nodule, they do the, the upper part and the middle part and the lower part, and they can maybe do three sessions um, separated by different times, uh, uh, by maybe a few weeks or so a week. I, I don't see a reason for this, but uh, um, I uh, definitely the data show that you can have a recurrence and you can have a resistance. Uh, as I said, uh, on average, they start to plateau after six months. Definitely they can keep going up to a year, but definitely after a year they plateau, but you can have some resistance with extremely vascular nodules and you might wanna try again. Uh, I did have to take patients back uh, for uh, another ablation. When they had like a big, huge nodule shrunk, uh, maybe 50% or so and start to grow again because it's very vascular. The patient is not interested in surgery. Um, they are interested in this approach to shrink and they were happy with just the shrinkage without an operation. So I did have uh, a couple of patients that required uh, uh, take back. I've been doing this for over two years now, so um, it, it, it could happen. Um, regarding the, the insurance, yes, I mean, it's an issue for reimbursement and for coverage. Uh, really, I, I, the reimbursement went down since we started. Um, and I'm not going to talk about numbers here. I, I'm, I'm in academia. I care about really the outcome more than anything at this point. Uh, but I think it's all, we don't have a code, but at some point we should, we are working through different uh, societies with our colleagues in New York to try to eventually have uh, more published data and codes, like a CPT codes for the procedure. Um, which will happen eventually. But I can tell you, I, I, I take a little extra effort. I, uh, I try to really try to get on the phone, speak to the insurance companies and uh, write letters. And I'm happy to share some of these letters with any of you. Um, just basically saying, well, listen, if this patient is not undergoing this procedure, they will undergo surgery, which is more expensive. And in some cases, in the same day, the thing gets really approved, uh, but it will uh, need uh, maybe some effort. Um, I'm going through. Um, so there's a question about, did you operate on a patient after an ablation? Um, uh, yes, I did. Um, so there's a patient that I thought I can uh, treat with the hyper, it was a huge, large hyperactive nodule and um, did not respond to the ablation. Um, so um, I took the patient for surgery and it's uh, definitely a lot of uh, scar tissue and adhesions. So I don't have extensive experience, but when I talked to my colleagues in uh, Korea who had experience operating with these patients after they they said they prefer to wait longer time and maybe six months is the number that uh, was recommended to me. I did not wait that much. The patient was like needed an operation. Or, so I had to do it, I guess, within two to three months. And um, definitely there was significant, uh, a little bit more scarring, but it was not like, uh, it didn't add significant, I mean, Hyperactive nodules are hyperactive nodules, but uh, it, it does make some difference, at least in that case that I did.
So uh, if you can see from the video, somebody asked about how does it look? Can you different difficult to monitor for possible malignancy? I mean, if you try to look at the nodule after the ablation, you're not going to see anything because of the effect of the bubbling. But like when I see my month after, you actually see a nodule. You can see the, the nodule. So it's not an issue. And you can always consider rebiopsy if the nodules start to grow, et cetera. Uh, a question about the biopsy at the same time. Ideally, the recommendation by the Korean guidelines is to have two uh, prior biopsies that prove that this is a benign nodule. So this is the current recommendation. But in my practice, I routinely, with every single ablation, uh, I do another biopsy um, to make another extra step of safety to make sure we're not missing anything. Dr. Ken. There was a uh, questions for the, the rupture. Ku, yeah, Dr. Ku keep said that she's still uh, think protecting, uh, trying to support the uh, the transesmic approach. I, I I respect all my colleagues. It's okay, but I don't think there's any study that compared both, and uh, I never came across one study that compared both. I plan to do one. I would uh, happy to compare with other institution, but. Uh, I'll take it from there. Rupture. I I don't have any experience with rupture or. I did not see any of this. Um, I mean, you can think, obviously, if you rupture a thyroid, you can seed the thyroid. To my knowledge, there are no published report of such complication of uh, rupturing or uh, seeding uh, thyroid tissue on the track. Did I cover all the questions? Uh, listen, I think this is really, uh, as I said earlier, it's a, a technology that as endocrine surgeons, we should take a lead for, um, with all respect to all our colleagues and other specialities, uh, we are the one who eventually will need to consider operation versus this, and we should uh, have this option uh, in our, our maternity, like, like to offer to our patients. Um, we're still having a problem right now with the CPT code. Um, uh, but I think uh, this should be eventually uh, resolved in the near future. Um, I think um, most uh, surgeons across the country who have been doing this uh, on uh, continuous, um, uh, continuously, they are doing very well. The patients are happy. Dr. Jennifer Poo has a great experience in, in New York and uh, John Russell and Ralph Tafano at uh, Hopkins. Uh, and many others, uh, but it's, it's something that if you start doing it, you, you see the difference in your in new patients and you see the appreciation of your patient. And uh, I, I just think we just need to figure out how to, uh, to learn it and uh, teach our fellows how to do it because this is here to stay. Thank you, Dr. Kendall for your great presentation. And thank you so much for your case discussion. Thank you everyone in the audience for your participation and visiting our innovation showcase today. We hope you find our event informative and we look forward to seeing you all very soon. At this time, I'd like to officially close this event. Enjoy the rest of your day at the conference. Thank you, bye.